It's really a pleasure to welcome all of you to this forum, uh, the Jonathan Lacks uh, Award Lecture in its 26th year. And apart from our local community supporters, I also want to acknowledge a large community that's joining us today for, from multiple regions of the world. We have, as I mentioned, our local partners, uh, Philadelphia Fight, a community uh, treatment and advocacy center uh, with multiple services here in Philadelphia, who, who is a joining partner to this lecture as a, as, a, as a sponsor since its beginning. The Penn Center for AIDS Research, the Botswana UPenn Partnership, and uh, Treatment Action Group in New York. Uh, and from up north, we have the Canadian HIV Cure Enterprise under Dr. Cohen and colleagues. We also have the European EU for Cure program with Dr. Rox and Dr. Van Dekerkoff, if I pronounce it correctly. And we have a lot of uh, colleagues from uh, Africa joining us, the Federation of the African Immunological Society, representing over 17 countries, the Global Gene Therapy Initiative in Seattle, the HIV Cure African Acceleration Partnership based in Georgetown. We also have colleagues from the Indian Immunology Society joining us and the Joint Adherent Brothers and Sisters Against HIV in Uganda. We have the Jawa Har Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research also based in India. So as you can tell, <clears throat> we're really joining a global community uh, under this forum to kind of share uh, research advances and, and promote the dialogue. So today, this program is really going to focus around uh, both community engagement and scientific advance. We're first going to enjoy a musical piece by Mo uh, Moses Supercharger, who would get us into the spirit of this community program. Uh, after that, uh, Jane Shaw was to do, as a executive director of Philadelphia Fight, was to do the awards lecture history, but due to unstable internet, uh, where she's currently at, I will do that on her behalf. Of course, not as well as she has done over the last 26 years, uh, 25 years of the lecture, but I will try my best. And then of course, the keynote address uh, from Dr. McCune, who I will also introduce as our speaker. Then afterwards, we'll have a global community panel discussion led by uh, Philister Abiambo, Michael Duela, and Moses Supercharger to really share insights from their perspectives from different regions of the globe of what an HIV cure means to them and what some of the priorities and some of the points that are worth noting as we engage this effort on a, from a global perspective. So first, let's get us started with a musical piece, which is really fun. Uh, Moses Supercharger is really a, a, both an advocate and a wonderful speaker as you'll hear during our discussion, but he's also a musician and an artist. And I think that he has embodied the spirit of the pursuit for research and the cure and from a community perspective that I think it's really uh, inspiring. And I'm really glad that we can share this with you. Now, please note that we're going to play uh, this online and the video feed volume is gonna come in and we, when we were testing this, we found out that multiple different computers may get it at different volumes. So that please uh, set your volume as soon as it starts in case it's too low or too high, uh, you can adjust it accordingly. So with that, let's uh, move the screen over and uh, enjoy the piece. I'm getting there. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> Find those who are adhering to the medication. State your medication. Listen to this song, it's called Optimistic, optimistic.
So hopefully you agree with me that that was a lot of fun and uh, also a wonderful spirit to commemorate in today's discussion and today's program. Joining us uh, from multiple parts of the globe in a discussion about our optimism and our hope for an HIV cure and the research efforts from multiple scientists that are working towards this goal. So I'm going to Every year, we sort of open this program by remember Jonathan Lacks and his exemplary role in our community because it is important that our history not be forgotten. Jonathan Lacks, after whom this lecture is named, was a businessman who lived with HIV for many years before he died of it and was a member of and participant in many AIDS-related organizations, most notably ACT UP Philadelphia. The lecture each year gives an opportunity to recall John's, John's activism in the earlier days in the AIDS epidemic more than 35 years ago, at a time when information was power and the gay and AIDS community was living through the 1980s and into the 1990s into a frightening disease that initially appeared to kill within months, about which little was known. It was in this context that people like John Lacks ordinary people who might have just gone on running a business and making money stepped up and became activists and came to recognize the wider inequities in information and therapy access within gay communities that allowed the epidemic to flourish for years before there were any significant resources allocated to stop it. John was one of the people who took the desperate phone calls every day and in the middle of the night to convey life-saving information to frightened young men who didn't know where to turn. He helped them find the AIDS doctors who kept people alive until the drugs came, and he helped them figure out their best strategies when the first new drugs finally did arrive. John recognized that people affected had to organize and fight for their own collective interest when it did not seem like anyone else would, which is how it came to be that this businessman, who was also a son of a businessman, who owned a, a large house in a very nice section in Philadelphia, came to be a leader in ACT UP in the 1980s and early 90s. People like John Lacks and many others and a whole generation of early activists 
fought the established interest in this country that wanted to ignore them, deny them the most basic right to life by withholding any funding, funding for research and also treatment. It has been the collective spirit from people like John that have enacted change, while the need for critical access to information and community involvement in the research process remains with us to this day. This lecture was started at Westar to honor John's legacy a year after his passing, to inform and empower the community with a yearly address on the state of AIDS research developments impacting their lives. And thus become, and thus begun an awards lecture now in its 26th year in collaboration with Philadelphia Fight, the main clinical and social provider for people living with HIV in Philadelphia. This lecture was endowed by the Miller family whose members have attended each year uh, and supported by Wistar, Philadelphia Fight, the Philadelphia Foundation, the Penn Center for AIDS Research in bringing leading researchers to this forum to inform our community of progress towards treatment and as the years have passed, functional cure and eradication. And also to remind us of the spirit in which people come together around a common purpose to join science and community as we move forward towards an HIV cure in the future. This year, we're particularly excited to welcome a wider global community to this forum as we honor the needs to make information and research progress widely available on a global scale. Indeed, John insisted since the first time we met in 1995 that any partnership between community and researchers must include outreach and education for the benefit of people living with HIV. We also take this opportunity to, look, to honor the lives of some of our local heroes like Dr. Rob, Rob McGregor and Mike Buckley, who also shared a common vision with John as part of the original Fight Network, and we're sorry to see them pass. In closing, I will share a story that Jane Shaw, who should be speaking rather than I, and would do a much better job as well, Executive Director of Philadelphia Fight, has shared in previous lectures regarding having found a quote posted on John's refrigerator when she was helping sort through his home after his passing. The quote is from Vaclav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic. And it was written by someone who became a social activist in the darkest day of the Soviet empire, when activism could lead not just to disappointment, but to jail or worse, but who went on to lead his country into a democratic future. Backlas Havel's quote is about hope and continues to express the spirit in which this lecture is based. And I quote, hope is a state of mind, not of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. It is a dimension of the soul and it's not dependent on some observation of the world or estimation of the situation. Hope is not prognostication. It is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for success, but rather an ability to work for something because it is good, not because it stands a chance to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Hope is an orientation of the spirit. Above all, the Jonathan Lacks Awards Lecture brings leading scientists to communicate progress and the hopes of the future without AIDS. This year is no exception with this year's award lecture to be delivered by Dr. Mike McCune, who has been a researcher and advocate for people with HIV for his entire career and a colleague in the worldwide effort to cure HIV. Joseph, or Mike, as we all know him, McCune, is head of the HIV Frontier Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and a professor emeritus of, the med of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. After studies at Harvard College and at Rockefeller University, 
he started to treat patients with HIV disease as a resident in internal medicine at the University of California, San Francisco from 1982 to 1984, and has been involved in the HIV research field ever since. This work included seminal observations on the first humanized model uh, that is still in use today, capable of being infected with HIV as a model of disease. He also confounded two biotech companies, serving as CEO and then a scientific director. In 1995, Dr. McCune returned to academia as an investigator at the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology, and then as chief of the Division of Experimental Medicine, which he founded at the University of California, San Francisco. In recent years, he has helped to form multidisciplinary collaborative research teams to find the cure for HIV disease. First, in the context of <clears throat> NIH and AMFAR funded collaboratories, and now as head of the HIV Frontiers Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Throughout this time, he has taken care of patients with HIV disease at the San Francisco General Hospital AIDS Clinic, Ward 86, and has also actively mentored graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom have gone to successful careers in academia and biotech. Dr. McCune's studies have led to the publication of over 280 peer-reviewed articles and reviews. He is a holder of 21 patents, and he has also served in multiple boards, including the Elizabeth Glasser Pediatric Gates Foundation, uh, and received awards from Elizabeth Glasser AIDS Pediatric Aid Foundations as well, the Burroughs Welcome Fund Clinical Scientist Award in Translational Research, the Merit Award from NIH, the NIH Director Pioneer Award, and a number of mentoring awards as well. And as I mentioned, he's been part of several boards, including multiple uh, community-based groups that foster education, such as Project Inform, Project Open Hand, the Gates Men's Health Initiative, and the Foundation for AIDS and Immune Research, among many others. Although Dr. McCune's many contributions to benefit people living with HIV as a clinician and then as a researcher are hard to summarize into such a brief introduction, I would like to especially recognize his development of the novel animal model for HIV that allowed to discover a really critical piece of information that post-exposure prophylaxis could stop HIV infection. An observation that helped lead the way to one of the greatest triumphs of HIV research, the ability to stop mother to child transmission among pregnant women. Through the, his subsequent work with the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, he, has direct, he was directly involved and had a hand on what has prevented millions of transmissions of worldwide and ultimately led to the ability of women of childbearing age to become pregnant and have children safely. We're indeed fortunate to have Dr. McCune now leading the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation efforts towards an HIV cure as somebody who understands the need for scientific advances to benefit a larger global community. The Wistar Institute, the Philadelphia Fight, to, together with our local and all our global partners, are extremely honored to have a scientist of Dr. McCune's stature joining us to deliver the 26th Award Jonathan Lacks Memorial Lecture. Dr. McCune, please join us. Thank you, Luis. Let me um, get this going here. Already. How am I doing? Doing great. So yeah. I think we see your slides and if you go to slide view. There we go. Uh, then I think we're ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning all from San Francisco. Um, thank you so much, Luis, for those kind words and the introduction and Moses to you and your group for that song. It woke me up. Um, it's it's really truly a pleasure to be with you here today and to honor the memory of Jonathan Lacks, truly one of the heroes of the early days of the AIDS epidemic whose legacy continues to provide so much for so many. As Luis was saying, he, he did so much back in those days to bring experimental therapies, 1980s, 1990s. We've come a long way since then. And today, in fact, I'll be talking to you about bringing curative interventions in quotes, and I'll describe that later, for HIV to all parts of the world. Um, and that, that is a, a stretch over the past 40 years. But first, what I'd like to do is to get us all on the same page and to talk briefly about the beginning days of the pandemic, those horrible days that 
prompted Jonathan to do all that he did. The, the remarkable development of antiretroviral therapy or, or ART against HIV. And, and then on the flip side, the limitations of ART that have prompted many of us to think about ways in which there might be a durable suppression of HIV absent a ART. And then I'll describe what we're doing at the Gates Foundation, um, which is designed to bring such a curative intervention to all parts of the world, resource limited parts of the United States, as well as uh, the global south. So in the beginning, way back in the beginning, percolating probably in sub-Saharan Africa from the early 1900s, HIV ultimately reached the states likely in the 1970s, and the tip of the iceberg was reported in the middle part of 1981, five young men with pneumocystis crania pneumonia, Los Angeles. I, I was a med student in New York City at that time, a little younger than Jonathan Lacks, um, taking care of what turned out to be my first patient with HIV, who was an injection drug user from the South Bronx with the same type of uh, pneumonia puzzling all of us. By the end of the year, it's estimated in retrospect that there were probably more than 200,000 infections and maybe over 300 cases, primarily amongst men who have sex with men and injection drug users, but in retrospect also in uh, those who are using blood products as well as in uh, babies born to mothers who were infected with HIV. Shortly after that, I moved across the country to San Francisco General Hospital. It's actually University of California, San Francisco, but this is where I spent a lot of time. And this turned out to be one of the epicenters of the pandemic around the world. Over the course of the next 10 years, HIV turned out to be the leading cause of death amongst men aged 24 to 44 in the States. And indeed, at this time, if you were diagnosed with HIV at the age of 25, you had on average about seven years to live. Jonathan Lacks was diagnosed in the late 1980s and passed away from complications of AIDS in 1996. So there was really not much in the way of a future for those who were infected. At San Francisco General Hospital, by 10 years, over 10,000 people had died in the hospital, um, even in, in wards that were there to give as much care as could be given um, at that time. During this time, Jonathan Lacks and ACT UP Philadelphia, of which he was a founder, and individuals across the country in the community, uh, care providers, um, reached out and actually taught the medical profession about how to do things um, and, and what could be done to take care of patients with HIV absent a definitive treatment. And during that time, primarily because we learned how to prevent transmission and also how to treat the complications usually the, the, the concomitant co-infections that are found with HIV, the death rate declined or at least plateaued and the incidence of HIV began to plateau. But it was really only around 1995 or so when highly active antiretroviral therapy was, was available that the death rate went down. And this was truly a remarkable time. The, the pills that need to be taken each day were numerous, onerous, full of side effects, but effective. And by the time um, this, this was out for a number of years, life ex expectancy was extended for a number of years beyond that, which was found earlier in the epidemic. And by, 19, by 2005, the uh, antiretroviral therapy had been, had been advanced to the point where we could give one pill a day, usually tolerable, and usually at the right time in the course of disease. And, and it would extend the life expectancy even further from 32 years to 64 years. But this was really great, but not good enough. In this slide is found, it's really hard to find, to stay on antiretroviral therapy. It's a fairly complicated slide, but the blue bars show those that are aware of HIV, of their HIV status, the, the gold, those that are receiving ART, the silver, those that are actually suppressed on ART, and remarkably, if you looked at the United States alone, you see that only 51% of those that are actually infected with HIV are able to stay on ART for a period of two or three years. This, these are numbers from 2019. And across the world, in some cases, the, the frequency of people staying on ART is even lower. Remarkably too, and, and especially concerning for those of us who take care of patients with HIV, even those who stay on ART are able to do so religiously day after day die 10 years earlier than uninfected age match controls. And why is this? It's primarily because they're affected by 
diseases that normally are only found in the elderly, cardiovascular disease down to cognitive decline. This is happening primarily because HIV sticks around. Uh, work, a lot of it coming from uh, the lab of Bob Silicano showed that the reservoir decays only at a very slow rate over a long period of time. And during this period of time, it's possible to find with sensitive tests that most patients, even on optimal ART, have low level but persistent viremia. And viruses are antigens and antigens cause the immune response to react. And the, the reaction that occurs is chronic inflammation. And we know from a variety of studies across a panoply of diseases that chronic inflammation is a primary driver of many of them. And that's what's happening in patients with HIV disease. So in, in summary, the status quo today is that antiretroviral therapy has turned the disease into one that is manageable, but it's really hard um, to put everybody on therapy. And for those that are on therapy, it's very hard to stay on therapy. And even if one can stay on therapy, chronic inflammation often leads to comorbidities and early death which led to the question some years ago, 10 to 15, I think is about the time that we started thinking about it earnestly, was that rather than to keep everybody on antiretroviral therapy for life, would it be possible to intervene with an intervention that could induce um, the, the immune response to suppress virus or possibly and or possibly even to remove the virus completely? And then ask the question, could you stop antiretroviral th therapy completely? There's two ways that you can think about this. One would be total eradication of the latent reservoir, sterilizing cure, not a very good name, but this would be one approach. Another approach might be to, as I mentioned, induce an immune response that would allow for the virus that is present to be kept at bay. Is this possible? Many things in medicine are made possible by, by the N of one, the first case, and in, in this case in HIV, it was Timothy Ray Brown, who I'm sure many of you know, the Berlin patient who was treated with two bone marrow transplants, almost died in the course of each of them, 2009, 2011. But after those bone marrow transplants with a, a, a donor cell that lacked the co-receptor for HIV, was found to be completely clean of HIV, cured in a, in a definitive sense over those next 10 years of his life. And since that time and during that period, a number of other cases have arisen and are, I think, beacons of hope and that allow us that are doing research in the field to continue to imagine that we might bring this to more people more frequently. And that's really the question that we want to ask of how to do that. Martin Delaney was the, maybe the West Coast version of Jonathan Lacks, set up a, a, an organization called Project Inform in the, in the 1980s. Um, and actually galvanized a number of researchers in the 2005 to 2010 timeframe to set up so-called collaboratories, a wholly unique experience in academic medicine for multiple disciplines to come together, to work together, to find a cure for HIV. There were three that were funded in 2011. Another three that were funded, including that, which is now run by Luis and Jim Riley, and I think Bob Silicano in the next version um, in 2016. And, and then more recently, another six new collaboratories, including one working on pediatric HIV disease have been established. And these are, these are exercises that are doing a lot of work, combining lots of talents together and, and making progress along the way. But there are obstacles and, and those include the following. First, it's a very risky, very tough thing to develop a cure for any disease, let alone HIV. And it's gonna take a long time. The incentive structure in academia is not really conducive to such long-term efforts. We're thinking about graduate students that have a, a four to five or six year time frame, postdocs that three to four, et cetera. It's very difficult to, to maintain activity of that type. The resources required to bring an intervention to the stage of routine use are well beyond those that can be provided by the NIH. And indeed, it's not even the mission of the NIH to bring curative interventions for HIV to those living in resource-limited parts of the world that are predominantly outside of the United States. And lastly, biotech pharma really has no commercial incentive at this point to pursue risky science to develop therapies for those who can't pay. And that represents many people, not just in the global South, but also in the United States. So the question that I ask is how, how can curative interventions be made available to all, and especially those that live 
in those resource limited parts of the world where HIV is so prevalent, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. There, there's a very low uptake of ART amongst young people. There's a very high incidence of HIV infection in young women. And there's also more and more young people being born because we have in fact with, with, with the limited but still palpable introduction of ART into the subcontinent over the past decades have increased uh, the, the lifespan of, of people there and there, there are more families. So this is gonna become more of a problem, not less. And I, I left academia is now four or five years ago to go to the Gates Foundation to set up a program, the goal of which is as follows here, the development of an effective, durable, safe, accessible and affordable curative intervention for HIV that can be taken anywhere in the world. We're aiming at those areas that have a high force of infection, a high incidence of infection, but we want something that can be used anywhere, even in uh, high income countries. Thinking about this ideally, aspirationally, um, we came up with a so-called target product profile. This is the way in which we wish to aim the curative intervention down the road. Of course, there'll be changes as the data arise, but simply put, for those who are unable to get to a doctor or who are unlikely to go more than once, which represents that situation for many young people around the world, but especially those that are young and infected um, with HIV and resource limited parts of the world. We want something that's really simple. A single shot uh, obviously is a euphemism, but it has to be low touch, not talking about intensive care units, it has to be administered simply, ideally in an outpatient setting, um, I, ideally as something that could be sent across the skin that could, like a vaccine, prevent HIV from coming back. It has to lower the viral load as antiretroviral therapy does to a, a, a limit that will both prevent disease from occurring in the individual who gets the shot and, who, and that also will prevent transmission because transmission will certainly occur in settings um, where there's a high incidence of infection anyway. And we want the duration of remission, of course, to be lifelong, but it has to be at least three years. Looking at the incidence of infection and the likelihood of exposure to HIV, once again, amongst the populations that we're talking about, the curative intervention has to be something also that prevents or controls reinfection. I, I, I include a reference here that those of you who are interested can look at, but it basically goes through a modeling exercise out to 2060 in various scenarios. The pessimistic scenario, unfortunately, is probably the one that we're looking at given the resources that are available for antiretroviral therapy in resource limited parts of the world now. And those dotted lines basically show if you, if you don't have a curative intervention that can prevent reinfection upon exposure, you end up at the same place that you were in the beginning. People that were quote unquote cured become reinfected. It's for this reason, in fact, that Timothy Ray Brown, who was cured of HIV, took PrEP to prevent infection after that cure, because the maneuver that he received is not something that can prevent reinfection. We imagine that the curative intervention, when it comes out, uh, the in interventions will be a, an evolutionary chain of them, will not work in all people at all time. And even in the best of situations, that'll be true. So we need to have something that can be used at home for an individual who has received such an intervention to know that it's still working, that, that they're not um, viremic. Maybe as you now use your antigen test for COVID, so too we need something like that for HIV. And we need it to be something that tells you that, you're, that the curative intervention may not be working before you're viremic and able to transmit. So I'll, I'll talk about ways in which we're thinking about how to do that. And then lastly, of course, it has to be safe and it has to be affordable. Uh, these price ranges down there at the bottom are, are ones which are, are really um, comparable to the antiretroviral therapy cost in different geographies in the world. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, we need something that's going to cost in the order of $1,000 to $2,000 per administration, including testing afterwards, uh, for it to be cost effective relative to ART. So that, that is the hurdle. And at the end of the day, this particular target product profile doesn't require complete eradication. Rather, it requires that we reduce the reservoir of HIV and control that remaining part of it from coming back. How do we do that? We thought about this in terms of a number of sort of buckets of work. I mean, first we have to figure out what the design of a curative intervention for HIV looks like. I dare say we know more about that today than we knew 
four years ago, but I, I think it's also fair to say that we don't know exactly what will be the best way to go. And so that's still work in progress and the collaboratories and a lot of work even outside of the collaboratories are working uh, to gather that answer. We want the design to be something that is given to an individual and that's durable. And here we're thinking about if it's an in vivo shot, a, a shot inside the body that, that will lead to a durable um, remission of HIV, that it would be best aimed at a cell type that lasts for a long time. And there are such cell types in the body. One in particular is called the hematopoietic stem cell. It gives rise to all the other cells that are circulating in your bloodstream. And it, it self-renews, it lives for your lifetime. So if you can target that cell, then you would have something that would be durable. And it turns out that we have a disease, which is also found in areas of the world where HIV is prevalent, for which we know uh, how, to how to fix the problem. And that is sickle cell disease, a monogenic disease. There's now about three or four different ways by which that can be cured by manipulation genetically of stem cells. So we decided in the, in the get-go that we would wait for the exact design to come out for HIV while working at risk to figure out how to target hematopoietic stem cells in vivo for the cure of sickle cell disease, using that as a pathway to then move into HIV disease. As I mentioned, we need to find a way to detect virus before it comes back. Um, and in this way, we're looking for circulating biomarkers, ideally ones that are non-viral of the so-called rebound competent reservoir, another exceedingly difficult problem, one that's also not suitable really for approach by single labs, um, work that we've begun to um, try to emphasize and that the NIH has now is also been working on, and that's to, to establish collaboratories, if you will, but um, these, are, these are groups of people, and I'll describe them more, that are trying to understand more about the biology of the rebound competent reservoir. If we do get uh, a, a therapy that is available, it has to be made accessible, and that's, the only way we can do that is to figure out how to deliver such a therapy to parts of the world where such therapies have never been seen before. And, and this means not only resource limited uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but also resource limited parts of the United States. And to this end, we've already begun 10, 15 years, probably before we have a therapy in hand to engage key stakeholders through a public private partnership called the HIV Cure African Acceleration Partnership. When this program was initially uh, proposed to the Gates Foundation, imagined it would probably take about 10 to 15 years and likely billions of dollars. And there was no way that the Gates Foundation alone could do that. And so the imprimatur from the beginning is to form partnerships, bring in people with organizations with orthogonal skills to share the risk and also to, to work together in that partnership to, to move things forward. And I'll describe to you in the next part of this talk the different things that we're doing um, along uh, along these lines, starting with the partnership. So we we began in 2019 with uh, resources from the Gates Foundation to 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 start this work. Over this was over a four year time frame. We immediately reached out to the NIH and formed a, a collaboration that was meant to be one to one. And now that the NIH has moved forward very uh, forcefully, uh, even more money has been put in by the NIH to approach selectively the, 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 the problem, can we de deliver in vivo gene therapies for HIV and sickle cell disease to resource limited parts of the world? And this has included also the work on biomarkers for the rebound competent reservoir. The Gates Foundation has an equity arm and we've made equity investments into a number of companies. Immunocore that has an a, a composition that might reduce the burden of uh, rebound competent HIV in the reservoir, BioNTech, which as many of you know, is working on vaccines, and Veer, which is also working on a type of vaccine that I'll talk about um, towards the later part of this talk. And we've also set up, not by equity investment, by a grant investment, a, a team that is dedicated to work on in vivo gene therapy for sickle and then HIV at the Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research in Cambridge. And this is something that I'll also describe in some detail. Once we have uh, biomarkers described, we hope to be able to develop them with a multinational pharmaceutical company. 
uh, that's to be determined. And we hope we, we get to the point where a company will be able to pick that up. And we're, we're, we're working with companies in a way uh, which is focused on their ability to bring therapies or diagnostics to the field, but importantly, and as I'll stress towards the end of this talk, in a way that allows for those things to be brought to the field with global access, that is to say to all parts of the world, not just to high income countries with insurance. So if this is the goal, where are we today after three or four years? Um, we've identified a number of candidates, a number of vectors that can target and edit hematopoietic stem cells in vivo. I think we've made a su substantial amount of progress in, in engaging key stakeholders, including those like Moses in Sub-Saharan Africa. We've established a number of partnerships um, to help drive the work forward. And there's been, a, I think, a substantial amount of progress in understanding the, the biology of the rebound competent reservoir of HIV. And now, three or four years later, it seems that there are several pathways actually for a single shot cure. One that I've been talking about in the past is targeting and editing long-lived cells in vivo. That's the in vivo gene therapy. And another is therapeutic vaccination, which can also be delivered by nucleic acid, as I'll discuss, which could lead to um, uh, suppression of chronic diseases like HIV, clearly not in, pertinent to sickle cell disease, but other chronic infectious diseases uh, might be approached in this way. So let me give you a little overview of, of each of these platforms. With respect to targeting and editing long-lived cells, what we're really trying to do is to move the existing approach, which, which is to take cells, hematopoietic stem cells out of the bone marrow, put them on a dish, modify them, and then put them back in. That's highly laborious labor, takes uh, infrastructure, which is not found in many places, and reduce that on the right to a simple shot uh, that would be given percutaneously or into the vein. When that shot is given, it has to hit the hematopoietic stem cell, shown here very simply on the left, is a self-renewing cell that gives rise to multiple lineages, including on the right, TB, NK cells, myeloid cells, erythroid cells. If the hematopoietic stem cell is hit and can be modified appropriately, it could be a treatment for sickle cell disease and HIV disease. We've also issued grants that would allow us to ask the question, can HIV, can T cells that are infected by HIV or myeloid cells that are infected by HIV be themselves um, modified. There are many steps that are necessary to, um, to move through for in vivo gene therapy. One is to figure out the right target to use, I'm sorry, the right vector to use to target hematopoietic stem cells. Another is to understand what cargo should be in that vector uh, to edit genes once it hits the right cell. For hematopoietic stem cells, it's really important to get them out of the bone marrow at the time of modification for, so procedures for conditioning and mobilization of those cells have to be worked out. And not least, uh, manufacturing safety issues will be really important with respect to the, the movement of this type of therapy onto the field. We've decided up front to focus on the very first question, can you actually target and hematopoietic stem cell in vivo using either a viral vector or a non-viral vector? If we can't get past that point, we're not gonna get past the others. So have issued uh, over the past three or four years, a number of grants, some of them are shown here, to academic institutions as well as small to mid-cap biotech companies and also to the multinational company Novartis to ask the question, which, which viral vector or non-viral vector is best able to target hematopoietic stem cells in vivo? We had a number of hits that look quite promising now. I'll talk about two. Um, now, one from Andre Lieber's lab at the University of Washington, or not, another, some other work from, from Novartis itself. So this work from Andre's lab was um, actually presented at the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy a couple weeks ago. And what he's using is a helper-dependent adenoviral vector, which has been decorated with a fiber, which allows it to be selectively tropic for hematopoietic stem cells in non-human primates and in uh, humans. And those cells are on this cartoon on the right, mobilized, the vector is put into the bloodstream. In this case, it's a, I'll show you next, a non-human primate bloodstream. The cells are modified and they go back to the bone marrow and, and, and do what they do, which is to differentiate into more mature cells. The vector's got a large cargo size, 35 KB, and need not go through the details here, but the cargo that he's put into it basically is a, a human uh, gamma globin gene, which might be important for people that have sickle cell disease, as well as a selectable marker that allows him to select for those cells that have been transduced. 
And on the bottom left, the time course over a period of about five to six months in a non-human primate is shown after three cycles of selection uh, to indicate that over, in this case, 80% of cells, red blood cells in the non-human primate are carrying the trans, uh, the trans gene, gamma globin, after that period of time. It's thought that about 20% would be necessary to prevent the vaso-occlusive episodes in sickle cell disease. In another set of experiments that he carried out with David Liu, he's shown that prime editing, which is another form of very selective editing of, of the genome, can also be carried out using this approach, in, in this case in a mouse, but this would be, instead of gene insertion, this would be gene correction for sickle. And this, this work is now moving forward in the context of um, a, a company that he and, and uh, Hans-Peter Kiem have set up. They've also worked on HIV by introducing a, a, a composition that I'm sure many of you are familiar with called ECD4IG, which was developed initially by Michael Farzan and found to be able to inhibit every strain of HIV and SIV that is known, which is, which is uh, quite remarkable, um, given the fact that broadly neutralizing antibodies have limitations in that respect. And when this gene, this trans gene is introduced into the hematopoietic stem cell of non-human primates on the bottom left, the serum Ig levels, ECD4 Ig levels, you know, go over 10 to 20 micrograms per mil for long periods of time. This is, this is out to seven months. And um, it's thought that about one microgram per mil would be enough to inhibit all strains of HIV and SIV in vivo. And in fact, when these monkeys are challenged, there's only breakthrough out to 890 nanograms on the bottom right, which shows that this amount of ECD4 IG that is circulating is both active and able to prevent infection. This alone might be sufficient to affect the transmission of virus that's existing in an individual, as well as to prevent infection of that individual from another source. Uh, we think that we'll probably need other approaches in addition to this, but it's a very promising set of data now. We're taking all of the grants, though, that all of the work that's been doing, the viral approaches and the non-viral approaches, and comparing them head-to-head -head in the humanized mouse that Luis mentioned, a core that was set up at the Hutch, in which these vectors, to the extent that we can bring them all in, can be compared head-to-head -head against one another for questions about the ability to transduce hematopoietic stem cells in vivo. That's a, a fairly reasonable um, data set that can come from a humanized mouse. And around this time, it's now we're three or four years in, we'll be taking the lead candidates and moving them into a GLP-like IND enabling non-human primate core work, which has been set up at the University of Washington. And um, there we'll be able to ask questions that are not ones that can be asked in a humanized mouse. In particular, what are the off-target effects and what is the biodistribution in general, the vectors that are provided. Hoping by um, doing so that we can select uh, vectors that have the most favorable on-target capabilities, that are the best safety signals. We will have to pair the best vectors with the best editors, and this is an ongoing uh, piece of work which is really being driven by the fact that new editors and new vectors are coming out every day, and we would then hope to rank order the candidates that look good with respect to their ability to be developed and brought to resource limited parts of the world. And importantly, we only move forward with companies or groups that will provide global access of, the, of these vectors um, that are being so ranked. With Novartis, the collaboration that we began to set up actually three or four years ago and then initiated a couple years ago, we were looking to engage a multinational company that had an interest in sickle cell disease and in whom we, we thought we could provide an interest in HIV and that also had an active effort in bringing such therapies uh, to in particular Western Africa, but in resource limited parts of the world uh, in general. And we stood up a dedicated research team within Novartis uh, to work on this effort. The, the company itself put skin in the game, matching the amount of money that we put in provided global access, and also gives us confidence that we have end-to-end -end expertise to bring any new vector uh, gene pair, gene editing pair uh, to the market if, if need be. 
They'll focus initially on the vectors that they have in-house, including lentivectors, AAV, lipid nanoparticles, but they're also in a position to assess to the extent that people wish or that other partners wish other vectors from outside, either those that come from the grants that we have funded or grants that the NIH has funded. And we imagine that in this process that after a period of time, hopefully sooner than later, that we'll be able to take the best candidates and move them forward. Briefly about the second platform, this is therapeutic vaccination, uh, work that much of you, many of you know about over the past 20 years has shown that there are some individuals that are elite controllers that are able to, to suppress HIV in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. And recent work from Gar Geha and Bruce Walker and team have shown that there are so-called network epitopes in um, HIV that are recognized by CD8 T cells in these elite controllers. And a question that, that is prompted from that observation is one, might one make a vaccine that induces CD8 T cell responses against such networked epitopes in non-controllers, converting them to controllers? A second series of observations that have, that have really come, I think, to clarity over the past four to five years relates to something called the vaccinal effect. This is an observation that has been actually seen anecdotally over the past decade or de past century, but basically when antigen and antigen antibody complexes come together, they're, they're brought up into antigen presenting cells. And if the antigen presenting cell is triggered in the right way, namely through an FC receptor called gamma 2A, the antigen presenting cell will induce a T cell response and a, a B cell response against the antigen that is brought in. And a vaccinal mutation called GALI E enhances the ability of the immune complex to be brought up and to stimulate such a response. Ask, which leads to the question, might an antibody that has that mutation against HIV induce a durable T cell response secondarily that could suppress HIV afterwards? So in these two areas, what we're looking at now are identifying more highly networked epitopes that are recognized by T cells in different parts of the world, and uh, out, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, developing a vaccine uh, by one way or another that could carry multiple epitopes and then setting up studies in which individuals that have HIV infection that are durably suppressed will be immunized, asking the question, is an immune response induced? And if so, does it actually reduce the rebound competent reservoir? With respect to the vaccinal effect, uh, three or four years ago, we began to set up with Sarah Fiddler, John Frader, Michelle Nissenzweig, and Marina Kasky, a study called RIO, which is now enrolling in London to look at the ability of two broadly neutralizing antibodies, 3BNC and 101074, to suppress HIV replication after antiretroviral therapy discontinuation and to induce an immune response thereafter. This study has also been set up now to ask the question, might such antibodies given at the time of, of ART initiation do the same thing? This comes from data that some of you may have seen from Ola Sogard presented at Croy, I'm sorry, at Keystone um, earlier this year. And to move this work forward, we've initiated a collaboration with Veer over the past year to ask if these IgG1s are modified with the vaccinal mutation, might the uh, T cell responses that are elicited and the duration of their, of their activity become even greater. So our next steps are to, to move candidate interventions to the clinic. We have 40 to 50 different ones to look at now. and We tend to down select to six programs over the course of the next year. Four of those will be looking at targeting and editing uh, primarily stem cells. Two of them will be looking at the uh, therapeutic vaccine approaches that I mentioned. We don't think that all those programs are gonna go forward equally well. And so I imagine that two to three of them will be down selected after a period of time. We've arbitrarily put four years here. And eventually we'll hope that at least two, maybe one, will go to the clinic um, for uh, definitive testing in phase two and phase three studies. With respect to detection, uh, very quickly, I think many of you know that after infection, most HIV resides within the hematolymphoid tissues that are spread throughout the body and that after many years of suppressive ART, a reservoir still remains up to 10 to the nine to 10 to the 10 cells. In work, again, much of it uh, shown to us from Bob Silicano's lab, most of this virus is defective, 99%, uh, in fact. That's still quite a lot of replication-competent virus on board. 
And we don't know much about it. We don't know where it lives. We don't know how to measure it. We don't know what its quantitative or qualitative features might be as a function of, of variables such as the time after infection or the period of suppression, concomitant co-infections, et cetera. We don't know why it persists. And we don't know which immune responses are best able to keep it at bay. And to answer these questions, we've set up a reservoirs consortium, which is now a five, actually more than that team, 40 lab, four year effort to discover circulating non-viral biomarkers to define these characteristics of it, hoping ultimately to have a, a in-home test kit or a point of care test kit that could be used in a variety of ways. One to understand the biology of the reservoir, another to uh, use as a gating mechanism for preclinical development of candidate interventions against HIV. A third would be to stage individuals with HIV, as we do with cancer, likely too for HIV, there will need to be different interventions that are applied at different stages uh, post-infection. And then this post-marketing assessment, this means basically is, is we need to have an in-home kit to ask, is, is this working over time? Finally, with respect to distribution, to get these therapies into Sub-Saharan Africa, clearly not ones that are gonna be there for another 10 to 15 years, we need to start today we actually started several years ago to set up partnerships um, that would engage uh, key stakeholders that are found there. And uh, the one that has been set up already is called the HIV Cure African Acceleration Partnership. And it is now run by Mark Dybel and Zuzu Sakazwa, uh, Mark of Georgetown, Zuzu in Zambia. Um, there has been the development and published a series of TPPs uh, that move from where we are today with combination antiretroviral therapy on through to a single shot cure. We're very uh, eager to support the initiative called the Global Gene Therapy Initiative, which is a grassroots uh, collection of, of um, investigators from around the world, including Sub-Saharan Africa and India that are very interested in bringing ex vivo therapies to these parts of the world, which will clearly be a stepping stone uh, before we get in vivo therapies there. And in a recent um, summit that was held, we've figured out a way to bring the work that was done at HCAP out of Georgetown, for instance, into Africa, into an organization that is run by Africans, uh, for Africans and for the healthcare of that continent so that the, all the work is done um, in, in the place where the diseases are being treated. So in summary, we have a candidate a number of candidate single shot interventions for in vivo gene therapy for both HIV and sickle. Um, we think that there are two platforms now for doing so. One would be targeting and editing hematopoietic stem cells in vivo and another perhaps therapeutic vaccination. There's a massive effort from what we're doing and what the NIH is doing to identify circulating non-viral biomarkers of the rebound competent reservoir and multiple partnerships are in place to engage key stakeholders. There are some obstacles to address and I'll close uh, just so that you know that they are there. Um, first, there's a lot of work as I'm sure you've heard in, in gene therapy in the United States and other high income countries, but most of it is devoted to things other than HIV and sickle cell disease. In, in fact, you know, oncology. And so we, we have to figure out a way to move those entities that can do and, and develop gene therapies towards HIV and sickle and, and, and make sure that we do so in a way that we have global access for the funded developments as they are developed so that they can be later used in low and middle income countries. We need to have a better definition, I think, uh, of what the design of a single shot cure for HIV would be. It's, that's, that, that is arising, but it's not, I think, just quite, quite there yet. Safety is gonna be a huge issue. Um, when you take cells out of the body and modify them, that's a much um, more straightforward approach than putting a vector into a body that can go anywhere. And uh, we'll have, I think, a lot of attention that has to be paid to that, that particular aspect of this. I mentioned earlier that we need to bring the cost of goods down to $1,000 to $2,000. If you can see this slide, right now, the cost of goods estimated for an in vivo gene therapy is about $100,000 to $500,000 per dose. So we're talking about a considerable delta between that amount and the amount that we need to get to. But uh, we, we believe that if the data so um, warrant that there will be efforts that are made to bring the cost down. A, a case in point has to do with monoclonal antibodies. Uh, 
they cost much more than that they, in 20 years ago than they, they do now, about a 50 time fold decrease in cost. And that's, that's what we have to aim for, is data that lead to efforts that bring down the cost of goods. We have to develop biomarkers still for the rebound competent reservoir. And over and over, we have to engage key stakeholders in these low and middle income countries to make sure that curative interventions are developed that can ultimately be used. We're, we're convinced that now is the time to move forward, not next year even, um, primarily because we, we have the science in hand to do what needs to be done. It's just a matter of allowing that science to move from ex vivo approaches to in vivo approaches, it will be more accessible. We've learned much more about HIV and we're learning more still. And so the idea that there, there could actually be a design for an HIV cure and the definition of a biomarker is within reach. We know from the example of the mRNA vaccines that te new technologies can be transformative. And, and, and I think that has put into the vernacular of many people now words that they didn't have before and concepts that allow them to imagine that big bets on new technology might in fact have an impact on other diseases than COVID-2. But we've also been shown, and hence the immediacy of what I'm saying, we need to do it now, that there are disparities in access to healthcare that are not gonna be solved on their own. And if we develop new technologies, it's really critically important that we do so in a framework that allows them to be used everywhere, irrespective of patents or cost. Um, and this is, this is a huge problem in the United States, as well as moving therapies into low and middle income countries. And I'll just close with a slide that I stole from Amy Patterson at NHLBI. Um, that this, this quote from George Washington Carver, there is no vision, there is no hope. We have to have that vision, I think, to move forward. And, and hope is basically in science, something that is um, galvanized step-by-step -by, -step by data. And that's, that's the goal that I hope we can meet at some point. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to uh, engage in the rest of this conversation. Let's see, stop share. All right, well, uh, thank you, Mike. So that was really a wonderful, let me see, can you hear me? Yeah, that was really a wonderful discussion and really accessible. And I think uh, I think a lot of uh, people were commenting on the chat and, and, as, and as you were going along. So, and just to note that this has been recorded and will be made available on a link. Uh, on the Beat HIV One uh, website, so please uh, check that website, and you can get access to the the link. Uh, so, Mike, a couple of questions. Uh, you you talked about having access worldwide as a major, you know, focus with Africa being one of the first areas that you're kind of engaged with different entities. So, one of the questions was what. How do you foresee developing the infrastructure in these locations to actually get a therapy delivered because of the, the disparity, not just on the access or the cost, but on the <clears throat> infrastructure to, to sustain that access? That's a huge, huge issue. Yeah, and the infrastructure includes not just brick and mortar, but also people trained to do the work, um, care providers that are uh, amenable to, to providing this care. Um, people that are potential recipients of the care who are educated about its benefits as well as its you know, potential toxicities. That's all what I would call infrastructure. And that's precisely what this public-private partnership HCAP was set up to do. We recognized from the get-go that it was you know, being led and set up in the United States and run out of Georgetown. And consequently, we've now moved it into Sub-Saharan Africa. The, um, the Gates Foundation itself has not been known in the past to be one that has set up infrastructure in places, but I, I think you know it's very clear that we need to do that and we need to do that in partnership. And the, the training programs, the, the types of um, you know, hard structures that are required, the equipment, that's all, that all has to happen. And Luis, it's not gonna happen overnight, um, but it's starting now. And it's something which I would hope to move forward. So is, is your program engaged in that aspect in investments on that, or you're looking for partnerships like in, in either local or 
How how do you foresee that? We've we how have long? we have extended um, some grants into sub-Saharan Africa in the first four years of the program. In the next um, years of the program, which we now chalk out to ten, we have. Um, a major commitment to setting up new programs uh, and to do so in partnership. And so we're working with the NIH and other organizations to do that. So there were also questions that were submitted during the registration. And uh, I think a, a question that I, I wanna give you the opportunity to directly address is, is there a cure today for HIV, number one? And, and two, what do you expect when an HIV cure is developed among these in this program, what will be the impact on the pan, on the epidemic globally? Is it, it because some questions were, will it end the epidemic? So I mm. guess put it in the context of of what's available today and what do you think would be the likely outcome of access once it is made available? Yeah, I'm, you know, I think if you took the case of Timothy Ray Brown, I guess you could say there is a cure today if you want to go through a bone marrow transplantation that has the right kind of donor cells. And you take um, PrEP later if you're sexually active and likely to be exposed to HIV again. But that's a non-starter in high-income countries as well. So the answer to your first question is no, there's not really an available cure for HIV uh, today. Um, if there were to be a cure, and if the, if the curative intervention were to lead to a reduction in viral load and a reduction in transmission, then one would ultimately imagine that that would lead to um, eradication of the pandemic around the world. And that's the goal. Right now, transmission is what's driving the lack of, of antiretroviral therapy, the presence of iremia and, and the presence of transmission. Actually, we've modeled this out in Sub-Saharan Africa it could lead to an increase in the incidence of HIV disease in the future if this youth bulge is maintained. So we have to block that cycle. We have to break it. And, and yeah, the, the dream would be to have a world without HIV. So th there was also a clarification question. You talked about how to develop strategies to really sort of crowd HIV out of targets because you're deleting uh, the ability to virus to infect cells uh, through, or you're also discussed strategies to enhance the immunity. Uh, and one of the questions on the chat is, how do you improve immunity in, these, in the strategies that are after increasing immunity in the presence of antiviral therapy uh, when there's no antigen or there's not gonna be antigen to drive? Good. So, so how, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, that's... Well, one would be to provide antigen um, in the way of an exogenous vaccine that would induce an immune response, even in the presence of antiretroviral therapy. Um, one might imagine that this induction could occur in some individuals better than others, those that are young, better than those that are old, those that are treated early, better than those that are treated late. There'll be some work that needs to be um, uh, carried out in order to understand where such therapeutic vaccine scenes might work. Um, to me, one of the more um, promising approaches is to induce immunity at a time when antigen is present, not, not when it is suppressed, HIV is suppressed by chronic ART, but at the time of ART initiation, when the virus is present but going down, or reciprocally at the time of ART discontinuation when virus is coming back up. And that, that is the exact um, mechanism of action that we're imagining for the so-called vaccinal antibodies that would bind to the antigen while it's going down or while it's coming up. And then the antigen antibody complex would be taken up, presented by antigen presenting cells and induce an immune response. But, but just to make sure to, to be clear that treat, treatment interruptions as auto vaccinations were tried in the past and they did not seem to result in suppression. So you're talking about, about virus in the presence of art and additional tools to make the immune system allow yes. fun, correct? That's I just right. wanna... No, Luis, you and I, we, we were involved in those, no. what were they called? <laughs> Structured treatment interruption <laughs> studies back in the early 2000s. And no, they did not work. 
So something more than that is required. And the, um, the idea of a therapeutic vaccination was not as high up on my radar four years ago as it is today, primarily because I think there have been some very promising efforts that have been made over the past years indicating that it might be doable. And that it's a testable hypothesis. It's certainly not like any other hypothesis, a, a certainty, but the science will go on and we'll understand, I think in the next, in the next two, three, four, five years, the extent to which it's, it's um, applicable. And once again, I believe it's probably not gonna be applicable to all individuals with HIV. Um, at my age, I'm less likely to make an immune response against even you know, the COVID-2 vaccine than younger people. And so in cancer patients, um, one is staged according to the progression of disease. So too, I think for therapeutic vaccination, it may well be the case that it ends up being most applicable to individuals. Um, it might be a subset of individuals that are treated early. And, and one of the you know, common discussions in the community has been the need for treatment interruptions in assessing the impact of the strategies. And you've talked about the, the need to get biomarkers for the rebound <clears throat> competent virus. So can you comment on what, you, what you're excited about or what you think is uh, good, good developments in this area? Well, I think we're learning much more about the, um, the nature of the rebound competent genome, where it lives, um, when it can become active, and in which cells. And I, you know, I think the recent studies showing that there are full length genomes that live in regions that are transcriptionally active versus regions that are not point to the possibility that that might be even a biomarker. This is work from Matthias Lichterfeld and Zhu Yu and others um, that corroborated it, that a biomarker which might even be applicable for use in the absence of a treatment interruption. And, and this is the kind of harbinger, if you will, of a, of a biomarker, which I would imagine will become even greatly, more greatly decorated over the next years. Ideally, one would want to have a biomarker of the quantity and the quality of the rebound competent reservoir absent a treatment interruption. And one, one question for Michael, which is uh, Noela, who, who will come on in a minute, but uh, he put up uh, for you was, what, what are your thoughts as to the barriers for getting antiretroviral therapy to be effective in suppressing in the US? You know, we talked about the, the cure is gonna be more likely to be accessible, <clears throat> any cure strategy is more likely to be accessible in the context of antiretroviral therapy. So, uh, so the question is that there are still challenges to delivering and maintaining antiretroviral therapy uh, suppression in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And whether, what, whether you had any insights on that or considerations in, the, in this area. I think the, I mean, the problem for any chronic disease taking a pill every day is that it's hard for people to take a pill every day. Even for hypertension, it's estimated, which is, you know, maybe one pill a day, easily diagnosed major consequences if not treated, it's estimated that only 20 to 25% of individuals in the United States that should be on chronic medication for hypertension are able to stay on it or stay on it. And for HIV, I've heard numbers, you know, for post three years, this, we, actually the numbers after three years are very scant, but it looks like it's on the order of 40 to 50% of those that are infected, uh, diagnosed, treated, can remain suppressed on ART for that period of time. Quite a low number. What are the what are the barriers? It's, you know, a lot of people don't have insurance. They don't go to the doctor. They get to the doctor, they, they don't go back. The medical infrastructure in the United States, you might have noticed actually in some low and middle income countries, um, suppression was over a period of time greater than the United States, and primarily because they have healthcare systems that are more robust than ours. So I think unless we have something like a very long acting um, ART that is such that people come back to it and continue to get it, that we're constantly gonna be met with the, pro with the, with the problem of, um, of people walking around who are viremic and becoming more ill and also able to transmit. Then a, a question raised, you know, there've been the debate about who 
which population is likely to benefit the most that is antiretroviral, anti, under antiretroviral therapy? There's the acutely infected coming on ART. <clears throat> there is the chronic infected, and then there's the long-term survivors that already kind of have uh, established some degree of a steady state with their infection. Uh, so have, have we advanced that kind of prognostication as to who's likely, or is there any evidence in your view that supports any one direction? I can't speak to that because we don't really have interventions that can be applied to those groups now to see if they are differentially effective in those different groups. But just speaking generally from the standpoint of medical interventions, and I think cancer is a good example because many people have familiarity with it. The earlier that you detect the cancer, the better. And so, you know, pap smears are a, a very effective way of catching cervical cancer early and preventing it. And in the United States, the incidence of cervical cancer has gone down, whereas in resource limited parts of the world, it, in the absence of pap smears available everywhere, has not. And other cancers caught early do better. So I, my guess is that for HIV disease, it's gonna be important to uh, detect test early and to treat early rather than late. And, and that would just be my hunch from the, the general field of medicine. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, we, we have, <clears throat> I think, as you said, intuitively it makes sense that if you, you know, inhibit the process of the disease early on that you're gonna retain a lot more functionality and, and less likely of an insult over time. What I find interesting is that a lot of mm. studies that have pursued that idea <clears throat> haven't really shown that these populations, these you know, dramatically change the picture of, a, say, a treatment interruption and, and a strategy. So I think it, it, the reservoir is certainly smaller, and it's, I think, logical that they should be more likely to benefit. Uh, but it's interesting that strategies to date have, have it's been hard to, to show that, <clears throat> kind of, you know, very strongly. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this discussion. I think we're gonna move to the panelists uh, who's been, who have been waiting on. So if you can stay on mic, I would appreciate it. We have, uh, joining us from Kenya, we have Philister Abiambo uh, from the West in the US, Michael Luella and Moses Supercharger who, in, from Uganda, who uh, we enjoyed a musical piece from his group earlier on. So if you can turn your cameras on, that would be great. Let's see, we have Michael, we have Moses and Philister. Hopefully she'll come on in a minute. She is on. Oh, she's on? Okay, maybe uh, my camera feed doesn't show her. Okay, well, anyway, welcome uh, all of you. So. Uh, I sort of requested that each sort of uh, share with us some insights uh, uh, and we can then have a, a discussion uh, afterwards before we close the program. So Philister, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Uh, so I would like to say thank you so much to uh, Mike. That was really um, a great presentation on how far we've, we've come with the uh, cure. Uh, development. Uh, so uh, really interesting and um, I was so happy that you've come up also with a different terminology about uh, cure and you've give, coined it today as curative HIV intervention. And um, uh, I was wondering whether this is the terminology that we should go on with uh, moving forward. Uh, because HIV cure is really a complex uh, terminology that requires really uh, in-depth and deep unpacking, learning and uh, and learning of uh, of certain words uh, like uh, rebound, as all of us know, uh, words like remission, uh, which is not uh, commonly uh, used uh, in our locality. And also just uh, the word cure, is it a functional cure? Is it a sterilizing cure? And how is this understood and perceived by different groups or populations uh, that we uh, work with or deal with in, in, in our communities? 
So these are, are really uh, interesting insights that have, uh, are coming up. So for me, I will say that an HIV cure to me will mean um, being free of uh, medication, ART medication, and also free from using a prevention intervention like a condom. And I should not be able also at the same time to uh, transmit the virus to other people. And uh, this intervention, uh, cure intervention need really to be safe, effective, affordable. It has to be available to me when I need it and I have to access it. And it also needs to be equitably distributed to those who need it, because we don't need to say that it can only work for uh, people who are uh, diagnosed early and not for those who've, uh, who've been diagnosed uh, uh, later. And then I would love to see an HIV cure intervention that will really address the challenges that we have with ART, such as nanoadherence, uh, viral failure, medication fatigue, the issues of comorbidities, uh, and also in Africa, as we are all aware, I should, I, I should not worry about stockouts at any time. So if an HIV cure or curative will really work in that way and mean, uh, increase efficacy and minimize risk, then that is something that I would uh, go for. So we also need how to understand that how do we construct HIV uh, cure through understanding the cure agenda ideas is also uh, crucial in our communities and scientists need to ensure that we avoid uh, curative misconception, which have implication or repercussion on the, on the cure agenda uh, generally. So some of the perspective that I would have on the HIV cure are, I would, uh, someone has already asked whether about uh, the issue of capacity building. I would um, love to see um, really uh, intentioned capacity building in terms of uh, infrastructure uh, development and operational management and proper and improved diagnostic equipment in order to identify uh, uh, the HIV reservoir early. And also I would like to see human resource partnership in scientific knowledge sharing in terms of clinical data and collaborative and partnership uh, research with a lot of networking, uh, with governance structure, proper governance structure, legislation policy, and conceptualized guideline in uh, bio banking, because we know that in HIV cure will involve a lot of sample sharing across, uh, across the globe. And these will really require that we have proper processes, we have proper leg legislations, and how we are going to share and benefit from these uh, uh, knowledge. And also I would love to see sustained really uh, community engagement with stakeholders at various levels of the power grid. And uh, this includes of even our institutional review bodies, uh, advocacy groups, our Ministry of Health, the government itself also, because we are talking about issues of fund, uh, fund allocation, how are we going to actualize this and ensure that the cure agenda is really addressed. In terms of uh, institutional review bodies, we need them to really have expertise on how they understand and review uh, a cure protocols in, in, in their custody when they get hold of them. We need to address ethical dilemmas in, uh, in curative research and also unpack, unpack the complex uh, cure connotation. I would also love to see like a safe and very uh, uh, safe and effective research with proper, a proper curative policy guidelines on management of analytical treatment interruptions that align to allow research participation in research without stigma and discrimination, uh, discrimination to ensure seamless uh, transition between research setup to the public health uh, system of uh, the clients or vol volunteers. I would also like, as, as we think about HIV cure, let's think about issues of access and equitable distribution of these curative interventions that we are coming with. And uh, when we come, we, we talk about access, let's also think about the uh, uh, 
participant preference. What do they prefer? As much as we have different candidates uh, um, uh, interventions that are on the pipeline, but what is the preference of, uh, of, of a client? We should also prioritize among countries and communities that are, have a huge burden of, uh, of HIV and ensure that really strong partnership and collaboration happen to maximize the benefit of HIV cure and ensure that we also reduce the risk among these population. So we, we need to also ensure equitable distribution of uh, resources or uh, resource allocation and ensure diversity in uh, QR research, including let's also involve multi-sectoral and multi-center approach of conducting QR research to ensure inclusivity and consider gender differences in, in various parts of the research. The, we also need to think about scalability. Are these um, interventions that we are talking about scalable? Are they going to be affordable? Are they going to be person-centered and friendly? And let HIV, HIV cure science also inform the curative so that they are acceptable to, to all. And to, uh, scale up can only be achieved if we uh, have intensified community engagement uh, really, we should begin uh, talking about HIV cure even before these candidate vaccine uh, uh, interventions come out uh, from the laboratory to the clinic because the community are the consumers of these interventions. So we need to understand what, what they think about these uh, uh, products and make sure that we design and modify these uh, products according to their needs. We also need to be very aware about ethical con uh, consideration in regard to consenting of these participants and uh, involvement of analytical treatment in case there is need to use and the decision making to participate and not to participate in these uh, 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 HIV cure uh, research. Maybe I can stop at that and then- Thank I'll you. Continue. Thank you, Professor. I think you, you, you've you highlighted uh, many areas that I think uh, uh, many, I think the entire panel, I'm sure Mike and, and, and all kind of recognize are really critical areas to be very vigilant uh, to, to and intentional to address. So um, let's move on to Michael. Uh, hello, Luis, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, about this. And I just want to start off by thanking Philister as well. That was so thorough, so um, embracingly thorough that I love uh, hearing all those things because yes, indeed, everything that she had said. And I wanted to sort of step back from what she was saying. I think we're saying going to be saying the yeah, same thing. Yeah. Um, but what I really, but what I really <laughs> see this as. Um, is, uh, you know, what does an HIV cure mean to me? I think it's what it probably means to a lot of the world, um, which is freedom, liberation. Um, a cure would liberate for individuals as well as for societies. I think that's what we're hearing a lot uh, echoed throughout what everyone is saying. Um, I think the real problems with cure just to be very succinct, is that they happen in high, the, the trials have been happening in mostly high income countries. And that means that there is a disproportionate number of white men that are sort of involved as stakeholders in CURE, and that needs to change. I think going forward, we're gonna need to make sure that we have better uh, community engagement and stakeholder engagement um, in low and middle income countries as they like to describe them, where people have HIV a lot more, and also in the areas of the world where HIV is highly prevalent. I think we need representatives there, stakeholders that are knowledgeable about the CURE trials that are going on and can then become better advocates for cure in their own countries. I think that's probably to me the most pressing need um, that all people who are involved in clinical trials need to get involved, not just community. We need research to be actively organizing their research in this way as much as we need the people in the on the ground trying to recruit people and get the information out and the education out. Um, so I just wanted to sort of summarize my take on where we are with, we're right 
that. I think it's a liberating prospect and it inspires people. We need to be careful sometimes with that in terms of not overpromising, but we also need to make sure that we are getting the engagement strategies to cover the entire earth and that we have research happening in the countries where HIV occurs the most. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Moses? Yes, thank you so much for organizing this amazing uh, session. And I want to thank my friend, Mike McCune for the presentation. It was really very resourceful. I'm called Moses Supercharger. What does an HIV cure mean to me? Uh, it means total escape from a cage where I've lived for, for almost 30 years. Total escape. I have taken medications for three decades. And right now, my biggest concern is what will happen to my internal organs? Will it be able to handle these medications for another 50 years? Because I want to live another 50 years. The ARVs have been so good to me, but I'm a skeptical. I'm worried they might not be able to take me for another 30 years or 50 years, which I want. So the cure means a lot to me. It's the only savior that will save me from this uh, problem. Options. There is increasing cases of treatment failures, especially in Africa. And right now in my country, over 200,000 folks are not virally suppressed. Due to issues like poor treatment literacy, access and stigma. I was scared recently to learn that actually even the new medications that have just been introduced, the long acting therapy, the monoclonal antibodies, people are already resisting them. Now, people are running out of treatment options. We have folks who have failed first line, second line, and third line. What will happen to them if their third line medication fails? So the cure is the only option. Stigma. The cure means to me a lot because it will take away this problem of stigma. We are being denied of opportunities. Personally, I was denied to marry the person I loved so much 15 years ago because of my HIV status. Before I declared my HIV status as well, I was one of the best radio DJs in Uganda, but I lost two radio <laughs> jobs because of my HIV status. The managers were saying, we're gonna lose business. The minute these uh, people who give us money know that we are working with people who are, uh, who are HIV positive and what and what, we are going to lose business. So I was kicked out of the, the, the radio. If the cure was there, that wouldn't have happened. Priority. What are the priorities? We need to get community involved into the business of research going on at each and every stage. Let it be drafting, concept development, protocol development, uh, development of informed consent, and actually even dissemination of what has happened. Community is usually left outside. We need to get them involved because these are the people with the virus. And these are the very people who will use this very product, which you are trying to work on. Let us get uh, involved. Another priority which I really want to suggest is collaboration. It is more likely that the cure that is likely to come will be a combination of cure. How will it happen if you have not collaborated right from the start? Because you have different products to be combined together, coming from different pharmaceutical company, coming from different, if they have not collaborated right from the start, we are likely to have a problem. So we need to collaborate right now. UNAIDS is reporting that actually we are having 1.3 new infections. We have PrEP, we have condoms, we have all prevention tools, but we are still seeing new infections. Babies are still being born with HIV. That shows that actually something is missing. All available options, treatment and prevention cannot take us to where we are without the cure. Therefore, we need a cure. A cure of HIV really means a lot to me. Children are being born with HIV and put on medication at an early age and they want to live for 90 years. Will their internal organs manage? Will their inter internal organs survive for 90 years. Therefore, they are also looking at the cure. I will stop there and thank you so much. Thank you, Moses. 
So I think it's really inspirational to hear from all of you. Uh, I think there are many researchers on the on this panel and uh, that really uh, work to try to meet some of the demands and some of the concerns that you have raised. I think one common theme that all of you kind of stress is the need for community engagement at all steps and the collaboration. So uh, maybe you can share what that looks like. You mentioned the, uh, getting engaged in consent writing, uh, educating communities about the strategies because they're going to be the consumers. Um, Mike indicated that there are you know, some, already some initiatives underway uh, with uh, I think, Michael, you're leading uh, one of those. So maybe take us through what that looks like relative to what you've been able to develop and how that could be further expanded. So maybe I'll start with Michael. There, I'm off uh, mute. Um, so I've, I'd probably say, you know, like it needs to start before the trials start. You need to be engaged in people before you have any sort of trial work going. Um, so like, for instance, I know Moses and I work as community uh, people trying to inform the global gene therapy initiative and their approach to bringing curative interventions for sickle cell and for HIV to Uganda and India. We want to have clinical trials start by a certain time. Um, and so we want to make sure that the community work in those countries is happening around specifically curative trials for uh, as well as uh, for sickle cell as well as HIV just not just the strategy for HIV itself because we think that there's going to be building of power between communities um, uh, and the way they can communicate with each other um, about the understanding of something as abstract as gene therapy will be vital. Like, so in other words, what we battle through with sickle cell will hopefully help with HIV and vice versa. What we have uh, battled through with HIV will help us with uh, engagement around sickle cell. So they're two different diseases, but they can feed each other, um, not only just scientifically, but in terms of community engagement. Uh, Moses, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about GGTI. Yeah, it's really an amazing um, uh, program, which is about to kick off in Uganda and India, like Michael put it. But my concern is, what are other countries? Okay, you have involved, we are trying to involve Uganda and India, but we need to find bigger projects to involve all African countries. Right now, the concern we are seeing is that when the funds come, for QR research, they're basically for laboratories, uh, basically for paying uh, researchers and uh, uh, laboratorians. There is no funding for the community. There is no funding to get community empowered about what is going on. There is no funding to pull community to join the QR research. So that really needs to come out. And I'm really glad with, I'm very glad with GGTI because they have really tried to even create an e -cup and uh, they're really trying to involve us, the community. So I want this to spread to all other countries and all research projects going all over the world. Thank you. So, uh, Philister, you know, one of the issues that Cure Directed Research uh, faces in the U.S., where a lot of the trials that have been done to date, uh, is the very sort of poor representation of women in, in the studies. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the likely sort of representation or, or contribution of women in, in uh, as cure trials move outside uh, into, say, Africa or India? Do you foresee some of the same uh, barriers that may be ahead to need to be addressed, or do you view it differently? Uh, so uh, thank you so much. So uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, in, you, uh, in the US, you're having a poor representation of uh, women. In Africa, we are having really good representation of women in most of our research. So we would uh, imagine that we'll have a, um, a great representation also with, um, with uh, QR research. But there are certain challenges and barriers that might hinder women to, uh, to uh, 
to participate in uh, QR research related uh, studies. One, the concern of um, the effectiveness of contraception uh, during QR uh, research. Are they supposed to use these uh, long-term contraception and how is the QR uh, intervention going to uh, affect uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the interaction between the QR intervention and, uh, and contraception? So that is one of the challenges. And then in terms of maybe, for example, analytical uh, uh, treatment interruption, is it something that is going to make them to uh, go down because they've stopped taking their ART and be hospitalized or bedridden? And in case of resistance, what happened? Because some of these uh, uh, women are already on second uh, line, uh, ART. So what happened? Who is going to pay for for the, the, the third line, is it going to be available for them? So this will encourage hesitancy among women to participate in, uh, in QR research. And then in terms of also work, is it going to make them, because um, in Africa, most women work to provide food for their family. How is it going to uh, affect uh, them physically? So is, if it's going to affect their work, then uh, women will not be very, very comfortable to uh, participate uh, in QR-related uh, research. So we really need to demystify and provide for, uh, correct information through engagement and also collect their views on what they think about QR-related research so that we may be able to develop uh, educational materials that target them and address their needs and their concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Moses, one of the areas that your director research in the United States is developing, we certainly at the BDHIV Collaboratory are working on this, is the, the development of at-home viral load testing. Uh, and the, the rationale is to develop strategies by which long-term interruptions of antiviral therapy could be managed. Is your view that these types of technologies are really equally as critical in your environment, or do you anticipate that individuals would want to go to a clinical center for monitoring? What What are your thoughts about that type of technology and and the likelihood of it being a priority or not for for your setting? We regard it as a priority. We regard it as a priority, but there are certain things that you need to do before you bring it on is education, empowering people, educating people about this intervention. Really remember, you know, this problem of saying, no, that thing cannot work in Africa, that thing cannot work in Africa. When art was first introduced in early 1990s, the Western world thought this kind of medication will never go to Africa. Why? Because they didn't have refrigeration because the first medication, the first protease inhibitor that was uh, discovered had to be kept in a fridge. So they thought it could not go to Africa. Africans didn't have time, uh, they didn't manage time, don't know how to manage time. Africans don't have hospitals, but eventually after insisting and after empowering, after advocacy, after putting in so much, things are here and people are using the medication. So even this tool, if it is coming, if it's already in US, then there is a problem. We left out Africa. We need to start with Africa. We need to start with all continents when we come with when we come up with a new intervention. We shouldn't leave it out. Yes, we really like viral load testing. And it's a challenge. People walk long distances, 40 miles, to go and access viral load testing. So if it can be done at home, then that's amazing. We have HIV testing kits now being enrolled in Africa. And at first people thought they will never be used in Africa. Now they are beginning to be used in Africa because there is that kind of education that is going on to empower people about its importance and how it's done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bring it so, on. <clears throat> so I wanna sort of let uh, Mike an opportunity to maybe address or, or share his insights of all of the points that have been shared during the discussion. So Mike. Yeah, I think it's a great discussion. 
It's so critically important to engage uh, communities with respect to anything, and in particular, you know, therapies that have both life-saving implications, but also life-threatening problems associated with them as they are developed. You know, a good case in point is what's happened with the COVID-2 vaccines. We did not engage communities. And as a consequence, the power that they might have affected has been lost on, you know, in large part. In, re in retrospect, and I, I think this is important to just embrace now, um, if we look at the beginnings of the HIV epidemic in the United States, and then move forward to today, I think the key word is, the key words are patience and persistence, okay? So I didn't go through the entire history, but I wanted to go through some of it, and I'll just mention a little bit more of it now. HIV was clearly in New York City before I was a medical student in 1981, and there were individuals that were having problems that were affecting uh, them and also noticed by the community. Um, it was called GRID in San Francisco when I got there for gay-related immunodeficiency disease or gay-related intestinal disease, depending on who you talk to. And in some quarters, um, research laid in quarters, there was zero interest in studying this incredibly important disease, I thought. I mean, why should this be happening? In, in San Francisco, at San Francisco General, there was tremendous receptivity to talking to the community. The community was us actually, but we learned more from members of the community that had HIV or that were around HIV than we could teach them. Project Inform, right? M Marty Delaney was there to inform who? The people that had HIV, but also the care providers. And it, it, it served as a nexus to bring us together in a way that was wholly unique. Meanwhile, meanwhile, if you don't remember, but you don't need to remember this, Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States of America from 1981 to 1989. And you know the pandemic was there in the 70s and it clearly erupted in the early 80s. He somehow allowed $12 million to come out for research in 1983, $12 million. And he didn't even mention the word AIDS until 1985, you know, four years after that CDC report, he recommended to Congress that $70 million be provided for HIV care and research. Congress said, forget about that. We're going to give you 190 instead, right? But the, the bottom line is that there was zero interest on the part of the government to deal with this problem. Meanwhile, pediatric HIV disease became more and more prevalent. It took Elizabeth Glazer 1988 to go to Congress to plead with companies, to plead with Congress, to plead with companies to make formulations that could be given to babies, her babies and others. So decade of maybe more of pushing persistently and just communication persistently made this, this thing work. And that's what we have to do now. And I think, you know, it's great that we have discussions like this and the steps that we take are incremental. But in, in my mind, they're moving forward at pretty much the same pace that I remember seeing back in the 80s. And, and the, the difficulty is here is that we have a continental divide. I mean, I think a lot of these interventions will be coming, likely coming from companies in high income countries, which Michael, you point out, have a profit motive. And our job has to be to figure out a way to allow them to be their better selves and to provide global access that is cost effective and distributable and accessible. And at the same time to be engaging the communities with whom they are working. And I, I think there are different flavors of multinational companies. And I think some are noble and others less so. And we wanna work with those that are the former, not the latter. And I think we have, as we do that, we have to really be attentive to and resourceful about setting up the infrastructure writ large, as I described it before, the concrete as well as the training and the everything else that's required in resource limited parts of the world so that the field is ready, people are ready, care providers are ready once we get these therapies to the field. So patience and persistence, keep at it is what I'll close with. Um, 
Thank you, Mike. Uh, so, so we we're going to move to some closing remarks as we close the program. Uh, in that spirit, uh, I think that, as Mike said, persistence and and even bringing us together in this and other forums is really critical to support each other in this in this movement moving forward. I think, and and crystallizing what are the objectives that we as a community want to raise as priorities that we can all contribute uh, to. So I'll maybe go through our panel for some closing remarks. And I guess I would like to both get your insights uh, uh, in closing this program. And also, if you can comment over the one or two things that you want to see different by the time we meet next year uh, in this forum, what, what is the priority that you want to see move in the next year? Because a lot has been raised uh, that needs to be done. But if you had to choose one or two items that would be in your top list, what would those be? So I'll start with Moses. Thank you so much. Uh, quickly, uh, the priority that I really want is invest in community education. Put a certain percentage of your funds into community education about the ongoing HIV cure research. Yeah, and I want to thank you so much for organizing this session and i uh, really want to thank you again for involving me thank you thank you and thank you thank you for 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 all your contributions and and your music and uh, uh i'm definitely a, a fan so i'll be checking your youtube channel uh thank you very much Moses. uh philister so thanks once again i would like to really uh see uh a very intensified and sustainable community engagement uh, activity among uh, researchers. I want to see healthcare providers being engaged because there is a gap in knowledge on HIV cure. I want um, the scientists in the lab, immunologists and virologists to come out also and help us unpack this language that is complex to us so that we may be able to educate our communities to understand what does an HIV cure mean and what type of curatives do we have? Because we can only achieve an HIV cure if we engage the community. As I had said even earlier that HIV cure, our greatest consumers are the community, and they can only participate if we engage them with the right and correct information on what an HIV cure is. Thank you. Thank you. Michael? Um, I would say I'm right there with Moses. I think we need put lots more funds behind community engagement and education. Um, I think that actually the people who should be paying for that are the NIH. Their own research proves that when they put money behind the COVID prevention networks research, that they've increased the engagement of people incredibly amount. So they had Native Americans, they had African Americans, they had Latinx Americans, all represented in their trials because they put the necessary funds behind that, proving that community engagement when funded by research benefits research. And we need someone specifically in the NIH to start pushing that and the community needs to start demanding that of them. So a year from now, I would love to hear that there's going to be a new institute of the National Institutes of Health, one that's dedicated to community engagement on, into, into the biomedical science across the board. So it's not just for HIV, it's not just for anything, but it is something that is funded year after year that has its own mechanisms that is beyond the research. That's the only way that we can really benefit research across the board and it wouldn't be a waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, so that's what I want to see in a year's time. Thank you. And Mike? So I'll let you, you, you get the, the final word before we close to, to, to tell us what, what's your top one uh, item and to close. To continue pushing. Um, I think we need to have a long-term vision and I think we need to have steps along the way that give us confidence that we're moving towards it. And each of the ones that has been mentioned is a good one. And um, that, I mean, I, I tell people, I. I see 
what we're doing is sort of like a marathon, right? You, you want to get to the finish line and you have to be trained to get to the finish line. And you have to make sure that you're, you know, doing so in a way that doesn't injure you. But at each mile marker, you have to have a certain amount of celebration. And so if we can get, you know, incrementally more money into community engagement in the next year, great. And if we can get, you know, more information about what the right test will be for him, great. Um, and, and this is what keeps us going. And I think as a community also, we need to stay together, talking together and reaffirming ourselves as working in a direction that makes sense. Because right now I must say, it's not a big community. It's not the kind of community that we need to have. And the more that we can bring in, the better. And certainly we have to stay coalesced. So this time next year, huh? Um, That's right. Let's get together again. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and and uh, well, I want to thank all, all our panelists. I want to thank Mike uh, for your time and sharing with us these two hours this morning. I think that uh, uh, a lot has been expressed about the, our common goals and our common priorities. I think that we all want to move the needle uh, a little bit more and community engagement and bringing everyone together from the beginning of the process to the end is really what the model should be and a greater engagement of all our global uh, partners in this pursuit is also a priority for us uh, moving forward. So I want to thank all of you for sharing your insights and for sharing uh, uh, your message of hope uh, moving us forward. So thank you. And I'll, and I'll just now go for 30 seconds just to thank pretty much everyone that contributed to make this program possible. Uh, there were a lot of contributions behind the scene to try to make this as look easy uh, and, and, and seamless. But most importantly, I wanna uh, thank Beth Peterson, uh, who really has been a, a major component uh, to, to make this program possible. So, and everyone else that contributed uh, as well. And finally, I wanna thank all our global partners. I think it's really inspiring how everyone has come together uh, to, to try to share a common vision. Uh, and we have you know, entities that, that foster education and information every month, like Treatment Action Group. And we have many other groups that foster research and serve the community throughout the year. So I will look forward to welcoming you all next year. And I thank you all for participating in this year's program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.